Yes. I'm going to do the YouTube thing. There you go. Good. See. Um, Audrey, thank you so much for coming and speaking. Well, no, I came and I talked to you, didn't I? We're going to talk about that. Um, you started off as a member of the Sunflower Revolution, kind of like this peaceful protest in Taiwan um, uh, that ended up kind of like pushing the current president into into power, like a big landslide. And then you ended up as a digital minister, which is pretty crazy. Um, what are the differences between what your ideologies were when you were out of kind of like conventional power? And what, what is it like now, two years after becoming a minister? Well, it's a pretty gradual uh, transition because I started working as a kind of understudy to mm -hmm. the minister in charge of digital affairs uh, back in late 2014, mm -hmm. so around December of the Sunflower Occupy. And so I served two years maybe as a reverse mentor, mm -hmm. uh, as the, the then digital minister Jacqueline Tsai uh, and I held training classes and lectures to over 1,000 public service uh, members in order to um, learn the art together of um, listening at scale. Right, so uh, it's at this post that I worked for two years or so, uh, before becoming digital minister for real, um, for, for another two years mm -hmm. since then. So uh, I would say the basic values are always the same. Uh, we want to have um, reliable evidence, reliable fact, reliable data that are crowdsourced, meaning that the citizens can also contribute, not just the government's data, and making sure that we can trust each other on the basic facts and evidences. And uh, second, that we uh, want to make sure that people know uh, that it is only once per year can government change its budget and direction and so on. And so for emergent issues, social innovation is going to set a direction uh, while the government may be uh, followed on the next year. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of things that uh, doesn't have to wait for the government to do. Uh, that's the idea of forking the government, of uh, taking existing government services and making sure that uh, people, when they say, oh, why doesn't um, anyone look at this, why there's nobody in the government look at this, um, the people in civil society can be that nobody. Uh, and fork uh, the existing government website and services and deliver it uh, under the domain name G0 B mm -hmm. W, right? Uh, and so that uh, still has not changed. I still uh, am participating in Gov0 hackathons, meetups, and things like that. And finally, is the idea of open, open innovation. Um, there's a lot of time uh, where there's a civil society contribution or private sector contribution, but it's kind of vendor lock-in. And so for the government, it's either uh, you know, lock into that particular inventor or mm -hmm. um, do it oneself, maybe in a uh, lesser uh, quality. Uh, but now, uh, using the idea of open innovation, actually all the projects in Gov0 are open source and open licensed. And so that means on the next procurement cycle, the government doesn't have to do a procurement. Right, the existing vendor can just take the better uh, quality mm -hmm. ideas and prototypes and so on and become uh, part of the merged uh, government services. And so that logic still has not changed. Mm -hmm. And so now I work, of course, on setting the procurement conditions and making sure that people uh, do user-centric or human-centric, as we say here, uh, design up front and things like that. But still, the philosophy is the same. Mm -hmm. How about you as a person? What's it like having I mean, like having this ideology that you you talked about, like learning from? the society on the internet and kind of applying that to uh, what you're doing here. How has that kind of like changed your outlook now that you're able to not just critique and to uh, like have a desire for what you want Taiwan's democracy to look like? What's it like actually being able to do something? Well, no, I, I never critiqued. I built pilots, I built prototypes mm -hmm. showing uh, how better to do a certain thing. I never uh, did a kind of um, just straight protesting. Uh, the demonstration that I participated in are more like demos, like really demonstrations, right? Uh, how to do things better. Uh, and really pushing the copyrights that the government can uh, pick up on their own pace. Uh, now, as the digital minister, I'm doing the same. Uh, it's just I'm joined, um, fortunately, by a staff uh, that consists of at most one person per ministry. Uh, and so at most I can have maybe 34 staff at the moment, 22, mm -hmm. uh, but it is very cross-functional so that from each ministry there's at most one person joining the staff. But I'm not giving them orders, I'm not taking orders either. It's all very collaboratively uh, set up. And so that's exactly the same as the Gov0 community, except that it's uh, done now by the Korea Public Service as well as the civic hackers. That's a really interesting part of kind of like your philosophy of doing things as well, this whole um, aversion to giving orders. Right. What 
What is your, first of all, your um, uh, lack of enthusiasm to the Yoga of Orders? Where does that come from? And then what does your way of kind of like, I'm not sure if you would call it leadership, but what does your leadership in this space look like if not order giving? Well, that, that's the only political system that I knew when I was 14 years old and joined the early uh, Wild Web Internet Engineering Task Force and so on. Because on the internet, there really is no way to really give orders, right? And people don't have military power, <laughs> there's no police, there's no way to punch another person across the screen. Uh, and, and so, really, the, the coercion based command doesn't really work. And so, the internet society learned very early on that the really only uh, useful governance system is built on radical transparency and also radical inclusion, meaning that anyone has an email address has a say on the law of the internet and how it works, right? And that's still true as of today. The internet society doesn't really report to any sovereign government or to the UN for that matter. Mm -hmm. And so that uh, legitimacy is built not from the traditional navies or armies or police uh, force, but rather by rough consensus and running code, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so that really is the only political system I knew uh, before I got my <coughs> first voting right in the representative democracy, which which is uh, when I was 20 years old, right? So it's for six years. That's the native uh, tribe <laughs> that, that I work with. And so by that time, I think um, Taiwan just gets its first presidential election uh, when there was 1996 or something. And so for us, there's no like 200 years of legacy representative democracy. For us, the internet actually came first mm -hmm. and then democracy, mm -hmm. right? So there's a lot of uh, leeway in uh, rethinking how democracy works based on those internet governance principles. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't call it leadership, but maybe it's just a um, adaptation of the collaborative governance into the politics. What do you think are the limitations of transferring like, um, uh, principles of internet governance mm -hmm. to traditional government, like the uh, like what the IATF or mm -hmm. um, uh, like some of the kinds of institutions end up using. Like there is kind of this philosophy of if you are able, then you can and should contribute. That's yeah, called actually stakeholderism. Yeah, right? but the especially institutions like the IATF end up having a huge amount of criticism mm -hmm. because there is such a high level of uh, there's a high barrier to entry. Terms of being able to um, be included, mm -hmm. how do you lower those barriers of entries mm -hmm. in the governance here in Taiwan rather than having a similar problem that internet right. governance? Because the, the internet, uh, as you said, uh, is built out of thin air, uh, from the thin air. It is very uh, abstract and mathematical um, construction. But in uh, real world politics, uh, often there is about maybe building a hospital, arranging some uh, budgets, uh, building a better tax farm system and so on. And so none of these are purely abstract. Many of this uh, has a really large opportunity cost that if we uh, set on a certain course and it, uh, we didn't consult sufficient amount of stakeholders and then they discover that it's really a bad idea and then we have to do everything from scratch. Uh, it's not like software where you can literally have a rough consensus and have 10 teams uh, doing their own way and then try out things and then see if it works. So we uh, adapt it in two ways. Uh, first, we make the regulations and laws, which are somewhat like code in that um, on the internet governance, there is no uh, copyright in the RFCs, right? It's all uh, freely available. And it's the same for regulations and code, actually. Uh, all those lawmakers' uh, products, there is no copyright attached to it. So we ask people uh, to uh, engage in this sandbox system called Sandbox ORGTW, where they can fork a regulation or even a law. And that says, you know, I have a local issue that's um, you know, structural, it requires coordinated action, and I have this idea that this is caused because the law is not caught up with times or the local municipal rule uh, is out of date. But instead of protesting on the street, uh, one work with the municipality, for example, and say, how about let's try for a year? And uh, to break the law, not really break, fork the law or regulation in, in hack the law and hack the law yeah. and patch the law, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and for everybody to see for, for one year. And then after that, if everybody concedes, it's a good idea. And then it's merged back into the regulation. So first we make the law amenable to the kind of fork and merge idea uh, that the internet governance is so um, important to um, put the emphasis on. And the second is that we make sure that everybody um, can be in their natural context because in a lot of cases where people uh, report a regional issue, um, you really have to step into their shoes, right? which is why every other Tuesday or so, I just uh, tour around Taiwan and visit indigenous places, rural places, and so on. Uh, but it, it's not that me that travels alone, um, but rather 
everybody, <coughs> the 12 uh, ministries related to social innovation are here in the social innovation lab and watching uh, the um, natural habitat of the people as I tour around Taiwan and they have to participate in a teleconferencing way. And so in this way we just merge the distance between Taipei and the local vicinity. They don't have to travel for four hours to Taipei to deliver a 40 minute talk, but rather I go there, I live uh, for a night or so, and I talk with <coughs> the local people on what exactly the social innovations uh, or the regulations they're <coughs> intending to break and, and things like that. And so uh, for all those cross-ministerial issues, these ministries are literally sitting next to each other. So it's unlike the old bad way where the bandwidth is really limited to compress everything into A4 papers. Uh, it's now real people, real stories, and it, it requires three ministries to work on a brainstorming solution. Well, they have 14 days to do so because 14 days after each meeting, we publish the whole transcript uh, to the internet, just like the internet society. And so because it is the public service, uh, people that are inventive gets all the credit. Previously, they're anonymous, right? And if there's any risk, well, I, I absorb the risk, mm -hmm. right? So it really flips the matrix of pay uh, off for the social, social innovation within the public sector. And so they're much more willing to innovate and solve a lot of uh, long-standing regulatory issues just because of this. How much of your job is actually coaching the people of Taiwan how to engage with these kinds of systems? Mm -hmm. And how much actual engagement do you get from people? Mm -hmm. Because there's kind of like this debate um, at the moment where I'm from as to whether or not direct democracy in this way yeah. uh, is actually very useful because mm -hmm. the people cannot be trusted. Mm -hmm. it's, often, it's, it's something that isn't spoken about often, but it's something that um, uh, is sometimes kind of brought up that we have a representative democracy in the UK um, uh, and therefore we should kind of like defer those big decisions to kind of like our representatives. And we've had kind of, like recently you had the, the first round of referendums that you guys had here, um, and they didn't necessarily go the way that many people expected or wanted them to. How do you um, uh, make sure that the public that are engaging with you are engaging kind of like in an appropriate way, or in kind of like a, a, a nuanced and uh, on the same kind of level as you guys? Right, so um, first of all, I, I'm not really saying that uh, the regional innovation tour, the sandbox and so on, uh, they're uh, necessarily taking place instead of the representatives. It, it's not nothing like that. Mm -hmm. right? What we're, we're doing essentially in design thinking terminology is to discover and define a, a common social issue, a, a common value uh, out of different positions. But the uh, develop and deliver is more often than not still the parliament and the uh, administration's business, mm -hmm. right? So we're not completely replacing the parliament people, but the MPs actually cannot regulate on something they don't have the first hand experience about, right? If we don't try for a year of uh, slow speed, uh, self-driving tricycles, uh, for everybody to have the experience of how are they supposed to regulate anything about self driving? Yeah, I think people often forget this is that often MPs are um, voting on things that they also are not experts on. Like, I think there's this perhaps a, a romantic idea of what a representative is meant to be like, but at the end of the day, they're also a person with their own well, like, I mean, many MPs are, are very, very brilliant. Of course, generalists, of and course. they do have the team of specialists. But the problem is that if you have only an innovation and without a ground to prove it or a multi stakeholder panel to establish its boundaries, there really is no way for an MP to extrapolate mm -hmm. it from, uh, for example, a lab setting to a real world setting, right? So, what we're doing essentially is bringing the citizens into the um, discover and define phase of, uh, for example, through e-petitions, through the regional tours, through the sandbox system, to make sure that everybody sees the first-hand experience of how people feel like uh, when there's innovation uh, on the way. And then after a year of close observation and data sharing and maybe like a zero even prototyping is done, then MPs can talk much more substantially uh, about how to uh, regulate it from, from the uh, long-term perspective. And so I would say we complement but doesn't reinforce the representative democracy uh, system. And it is through this that, the, for example, e-petition and e-participation system join the GOV.tw uh, has maybe 5 million uh, users out of 23 million in Taiwan, which is about one quarter of people who are yeah. on the internet, which is pretty good, actually. Uh, and that, that's because people can participate in the full life cycle. There, it's not just e-petition, but actually regulatory pre-announcements, uh, the visualization of the 
the budgets, and people can actually comment on each and every um, budget. There's 1,300 or so of the annual budgets of each um, project uh, by each ministry, and when people comment publicly, the public service actually replies publicly, and so that lowers the contextual uh, mismatch between the public service on one hand and the public citizens on the other hand. And all this is actually saving the MPs a lot of work. We're not taking away MPs' job. We're, we're saying that we don't have to explain to their constituents over and again of what the administration is doing because everything is actually online and they can talk about values, not the, the facts, because the facts are easily accessible. What does this engagement look like? Uh, who, who are engaging? Uh, do they tend to be younger, older? Do they tend to be from uh, indigenous communities or Han communities? Yeah. Um, like, do you have that information on yes, 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 we, we, we actually do. Um, the interesting thing in Taiwan is that broadband is a human right. So anywhere in Taiwan, if you don't have 10 megabits per second, it's our fault. Right? So that's why I can tour around Taiwan to all those indigenous rural places while keeping a good video bi-directional link uh, with people on the social innovation mm -hmm. level. Without broadband, it's a human right. It's impossible, right? And so because of this, we're not actually seeing a lot of um, digital gaps people who <clears throat> participate. Uh, we're seeing, of course, the younger people, the students, as well as the retired people. They spend more time on mm -hmm. the platform because they will have more time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, but but I, I do agree that if you're, a, for example, a uh, someone with a resident uh, certificate but holding a foreign passport, or if your uh, primary language is not um, Taiwanese Hakka, Taiwanese Olok, or Mandarin, uh, then a lot of participation you're going to rely on Google Translate. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's not exactly 100% accurate. And so at the moment, we're working on a new national goal of at least uh, having the um, government's official websites to be bilingual, that is to say Chinese and English. Um, I think by next year or so, about 70% of the public administration will offer English-based information. And we would gradually roll out this bilingual strategy so that people who don't read uh, kanji uh, can still participate in a meaningful way without relying completely on machine translation. Mm -hmm. At the moment, I think the language gap is the largest gap. Really? Yeah. So you're, you're saying that the biggest gap that you guys have is with I, I, people with yeah. foreign passports who have like permanent residency here? Yeah, and because there's really... Yes, can you just put your hair... Yeah. There's, there's really a lot of... Um, um, really discrepancies because, um, for example, for some uh, very more websites, there's bilingual versions, but the English version is out of date. That is one thing that we're actively looking to solve. Um, sometimes when you Google, uh, for, for example, the AI Taiwan strategy, now it's easy because you just get one website, ai.taiwan.gov.tw, but previously it's like four different uh, ministries, two of which have English, uh, and, and there really is very difficult for a non-Chinese uh, speaker to uh, put everything together. And But now we're switching to this um, single entry point uh, way of presenting the visions, the action plan, and news uh, throughout the different municipalities and ministries in a single version. So you can have AI Taiwan, CI Taiwan for collective intelligence, Smart Taiwan, Bio Taiwan, Social Innovation, SI Taiwan, and so on. And so, yeah, that's the roadmap we're gradually going to. It's not to require everybody to navigate the maze that is the um, English uh, websites, but rather to merge things into a English-friendly um, portal. And that's really the number one thing we're looking at. Yeah. Who, uh, out of Taiwanese nationals, who is kind of left behind with this digital innovation? Sorry, can you just put your jacket on it? So yes. Okay. Right. So um, I think um, because so for example, when we yeah. when we look at um, like government digitization of government services, yes. there are um, uh, lots of stories, especially uh, like I think of my own country because that's my um, uh, that's my reference point. Mm. Um, a lot of people who are not necessarily computer literate, um, uh, who do not have as much access to. to Broadband services, which is obviously different in Taiwan, yeah. um, uh, but it you end up seeing a system that works incredibly well and much better for the majority. But there is a minority who are kind of left behind. Um, uh, right. Who who gets left behind? And I don't know how much you want to divulge that, but 
Well, a few things, right? Not only broadband is a human right, but actually access to tablets and so on is actually something that we make sure that in the education system, uh, even the people who cannot afford it actually are guaranteed to have access to it and so on. <coughs> through digital opportunity centers, through the tribal opportunity centers, and things like that. And so, yeah, when we're designing the government digital services, uh, <coughs> we ensure that the digital is actually in service of the people's needs uh, and that we have multiple service channels and making sure that the resource required for the service is equally um, giving priorities to openness. And the priority to openness is very important because exactly as you said, if you are um, of a certain uh, learning difficulty or modality of learning and things like that, uh, then the, the space need to con be constructed with people's need in mind. Uh, for example, the um, uh, visual design, the geometry here in the Social Innovation Lab uh, are designed by people with Down syndrome. And people with Down syndrome see the world in a very geometric way. Yeah? And uh, the trisomy uh, um, condition enables them to interpret things differently. And so to make sure that our services are friendly to people with Down syndrome, people with various different um, physical and um, mental abilities and things like that, that is only possible if we design the service so that it can, it's extensible. Right, like a text file system or a digital service, of course we can't cater to every uh, people with every different uh, special modalities. But if we keep the API open, then people who specialize uh, with working with these people, like the Children of Arts Foundation who specialize with uh, working with people with Down syndrome, mm -hmm. uh, they can contract their own, uh, for example, chatbot designer or, or I don't know, immersive reality designer or whatever designers to re-deliver the government service, which we say, you know, if you're accessible to blind people, a uh, machine is a kind of blind people, so you have to be machine readable and writable as well. And if people uh, who are procuring, they find that their vendors cannot deliver a machine writable, a readable API interface, then the vendor can actually be disqualified for unprofessionalism. And so just by making sure that machines are also people, uh, mm -hmm. and for accessibility, uh, we make sure that people who work, uh, those people who you said uh, would be left behind, has a fair chance of adapting it into uh, braille displays or, or whatever uh, mm -hmm. modalities. So is that kind of like centrally uh, decided in terms of um, where those resources end up going? Because it sounds like you have an awful lot of freedom here mm -hmm. in order to be able to kind of like encourage that engagement with digital governance. Well, yeah, very much so. Yes. Um, uh, but at what point does kind of like the financing will become an issue. How do you how do you pay for all of this amazing stuff that you're doing? Well, social enterprises, of course. <laughs> yeah, um, Taiwan actually has a very strong social enterprise tradition. So much so that I think um, the legitimacy of the largest social enterprises, such as the Homemakers Union, the Children of Us, or the Tsuji Foundation, are higher actually than governments in many circumstances, and that's because they have a head start. As I said, uh, our first presidential election is 96, mm -hmm. but the lifting of the martial law is 87. And so there's a, a decade of uh, the government slowly transitioning into a democracy, but the civil society, the social sector is already uh, growing right, uh, and gaining legitimacy. So the uh, end result is that um, they're actually kind of um, financially self-sufficient, and that's an understatement. Uh, <laughs> and, and also that they are able to independently fund uh, a lot of these, as I said, uh, accessibility and inclusion um, engagement um, end of us, as long as the government agrees to work as a partner instead of treating them as vendors, because they have higher legitimacy, uh, they demand a partnership um, equal treatment uh, rather than a vendor-like uh, relationship with the government. So on every case where we offer a open co-design uh, opportunity, like the design of this very social innovation lab, uh, we do have a lot of contributors from hundreds of uh, social enterprises and social innovation groups, co-ops and uh, foundations and uh, companies and so on. Uh, and I, I, what I love most is that they're not uh, for-profit, they're with-profit, meaning that they're profitable, but profit is not their purpose. Um, and so uh, we're now just working with them and not for them. And, and that is, I think, the most important thing about this kind of collaborative government mm -hmm. is that we're not working for these people. These are not vulnerable people. They are actually people with a higher legitimacy at times uh, and actually better financing than government at times uh, for many accessibility and inclusion endeavors. I want to pivot a little bit to kind of like this idea of consensus politics because mm -hmm. this is something that you've talked about a lot. It was in Taiwan's um, uh, kind of like inaugural speech, President mm -hmm. Ruff 
consensus. Right, oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, this kind of like it's an honourable, it's an honourable goal to have kind of like to, to accept this plurality of views and see kind of like um, uh, where can we all agree and then decide on uh, where you're going to go from there. Mm -hmm. um, is that because we, we see the opposite happening mm -hmm. in uh, Western democracies at the moment? Like Paris is literally burning. Um, uh, and the UK is like splitting itself um, in two, basically, over the crazy no, question. No, 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 no. <laughs> pretty close, I've got a spade, started digging. Okay. Um, uh, what do you think, um, uh, like the, the home of kind of like the idea of Austin democracy, what do you think Europe could possibly learn from you, what you guys are doing? Yeah, well, whenever we build a space where people can safely express their feelings uh, in an additive space, meaning that they can only add to each other without um, taking away from each yeah, other's right. credibility, we always see a distribution like this. So I'm not pretending that the divisive uh, ideologies and statements are not there, but they're just that. Uh, meaning that people actually agree on a lot of things with their neighbors. And that, that's what the rough in rough consensus means, right? It means that we roughly agree on a few things. And these things, they can just take place immediately. Mm -hmm. And while we work on the no, more divisive issues, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is not pretending that divisive issues doesn't exist. It's not letting them dominate our attention in the news cycle and everything, right? It's by focusing on the things that we can actually agree on uh, and then uh, deepening the agreement by getting people to share their reflections mm -hmm. and so on. And so I, I think this is not a commentary on uh, replacing the democratic institutions, mm -hmm. but rather uh, letting people see the overview effect of uh, the entire democratic institutions, like having a reflective space that reflects the entire population's feelings, rather than just the five divisive ideologies. What happens when people capitalize on that long tail that of like the especially divisive things that often um, talk about alienating the other um, and politically uh, kind of like, well, I mean, you don't call it fake news. What have I seen you call it? Yes, um, uh, the automated dissemination of disinformation. I think that you use. Um, how do you, these bad actors, how do you ensure that these bad actors don't throw the whole system uh, like off kilter and completely destroy it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, we had a similar challenge back in early 2000 about junk mail or mm -hmm. spam. Uh, I think that's the common language. Uh, and for a while, people thought the email is broken and, and we're going to all abandon this idea of sending email without a postage fee. Uh, because people are really seriously proposing that at the time. Uh, and people are overwhelmed with emails from Nigerian princesses or mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, I'm already a multi-billionaire, actually. Uh, yeah, I found well, myself a Nigerian princess. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. uh, with all due respect. Uh, I'm just waiting for the check. That's right, that's right, that's right. Uh, so, with all due respect with the people in Nigeria, I'm sorry uh, for using uh, that example, but in any case, um, really the spam issue is solved not by law, really. There, there is some law, of course, about uh, one click unsubscribing, about unsolicited email, but by and large, it's by volunteers who flag uh, junk mails as junk mail, and uh, coordinated technical solutions like the Spam House, uh, which is a kind of global transparency network that identifies the signatures of junk mails and then making sure that it, they work with all the mail service providers to make sure that the uh, emails are receiving those uh, messages or those signals, they don't get propagated further so that uh, now you have to actually click into the spam folder uh, to, to see those um, junk emails so they don't dominate people's attention and so on. So it's not by any single actor, but every, every actor makes it more costly to send spam. Maybe you need to get a digital signature and things like that. And on the other hand, the return of spam is decreased by every single action of lowering people's attention priority. And at some point, uh, it doesn't pay to send spam anymore. So people mm -hmm. switch to some other way of um, you know, calming people. Uh, but I, I, I'm, what I'm saying basically is a really a multi stakeholder thing, mm -hmm. um, which is now why we're working with the GovZero uh, project, for example, the COFAC project, which uh, lets you in WhatsApp or uh, enter an encrypted channel. When you see it, this information is being spread, you can flag it mm -hmm. and then post it to the public web. So it's like a clearinghouse mm -hmm. of all the trendy uh, disinformation you can see actually on one go. We saw this yeah. with like the um, the, the, the 
Mm. We've got them with the referendums, yeah. the referendums, right? There was a lot of disinformation being right. spread in these closed networks. That's right. and then and once flagged, yeah, yeah, right. Like this got this got flagged um, publicly, right. and there was a lot of um, conversation about how to make that better. That's right. um, but at the end of the day, there were still people being misinformed by that information, and didn't right. necessarily end up seeing. Right. Yeah, because Kofag, uh, which is a great line, but only delivered the last mile to line, right? To, to, and maybe it's getting ported uh, to WhatsApp and other end encrypted channels, mm -hmm. but it doesn't go all the way, right? It doesn't go to, for example, the print encrypted small cards mm -hmm. that people hand out, right? So for every last mile delivery, you need a uh, people working on that last mile delivery so that people, when they encounter this information, they can receive the corrected information in the same channel that they're engaging in. Mm -hmm. uh, and the government, of course, is we're committed to have a way for people to flag uh, these issues that requires government clarification and clarify it within four hours so that everybody has a fact or at least evidence from the government's perspective mm -hmm. uh, to add to. And the Taiwan Fact Checking Center, for example, the TFCC, recently joined the International Fact Checking Net Network which means that by early next year, uh, their output, uh, where they fact check a, a trending rumor, sometimes actually surface from pro facts, um, they actually get plugged into the algorithm uh, of the popular social media channels, mm -hmm. and so that they can actually input into the virality of the message, so that the virality of the things that they clarify already as false, for example, referendum takes higher place than constitution, uh, can actually um, dwindle mm -hmm. uh, in the people that they reach. And so this takes both a textual normativity, meaning the law need to be more specific about this information, mm -hmm. and, but also the algorithm need to be more aware about this information. So it takes all sides. And just like junk mail, I think we took four years mm -hmm. uh, to solve that problem. This one is going to take a similar amount of time. Do you think these referendum results, not just around like the LGBT education and, and mm -hmm. same-sex marriage, but on um, uh, uh, the wide ones about like um, or the name that Taiwan uses when it goes mm -hmm. to like the Olympics and stuff, mm -hmm. do you think that the results here um, are less kind of like a, a, a kind of represent quite well the fact that it still needs time for this system that is being built around kind of like this more direct? Democracy needs more time in order to be a, in order for it to actually be useful and to work efficiently. Well, I, I think well, it needs more time and more efficiently. Well, um, yeah, I think the lining up needs to be more efficient. That's mm -hmm. for sure. Uh, people took very long lines to to vote those referendum votes, and that's I think the number one thing that we can improve in the service design perspective. Mm -hmm. Of course, we can increase uh, people's happiness uh, instead of waiting for like two or three hours, uh, and that's going to happen uh, real quick uh, on the next election. Uh, on the other hand, of course, uh, the discussion mm -hmm. period before the referendum, uh, this this time I think it's really shortened because it has to go with the major election. Yeah, you didn't see many um, uh, adverts or debates and stuff. That's right. And, and even in the uh, law mandated debates, the uh, CEC can only make sure that every side, uh, the pro and con, has an uh, equal number of seconds. All right. That, but that's the only thing that they guarantee. <coughs> there's no uh, substantial deliberation, um, and there's no time for substantial deliberation, actually. So one thing <coughs> we learned is that <coughs> sorry, so we need to shorten the time that people line up to actually <coughs> vote the referendum, but we need to lengthen the time that people take uh, to actually get a quality conversation around the <coughs> actual effect of the referendum. Because I think a lot of people actually going to the referendum and afterwards they have different ideas about what this actually means. What does it actually mean to bind the legislation and administration for two years on a particular direction? Some people have different interpretations of what the referendum actually means, mm -hmm. even though it's spelled very clearly by law. So I, I don't think it's the people's problem because we can't expect everybody to be a constitutional lawyer. But had we have a, a more substantial deliberation period before the referendum, I think a lot of people would be a lot more clear about what exactly their, their referendum is. Do you think? Do you think it would have changed um, the results of those referendum? I don't know. Mm. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll, we'll see next time. Yeah, that'll be we'll exciting next time. Yeah. Um, do you think what you're building here uh, has sustainability in terms of the way that the legislative UN actually works, mm -hmm. or is this a partisan thing that you're building here? Um, if 
um, uh, heaven forbid, the DPP were not to get a majority in the presidency um, uh, in 2020. Is it possible that what you're building could uh, be scaled back or damaged in any way? How are you building a legacy? Well, the different distribution system, actually the entire system was built around uh, Premier Montreux and Premier Simon John, right? So Simon John is not exactly PMT. Uh, but in any case, it was uh, under the mind of our administration. Mm -hmm. And so I think when people are used to it, it's very difficult to go back. Mm -hmm. um, and end of 2014, we see that anyone who um, you know, advocate for greater transparency, uh, automatically gets more votes. Uh, and at this time, actually, even for people who are KMP or MVP or DDP, <laughs> nobody really proposed anything that rolls back uh, mm -hmm. the uh, existing transparency and participation uh, efforts in the city level or municipal level or county level. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a very encouraging sign because that means that people think it's a natural part of democracy, right? So uh, people don't have to specifically shout for it, mm -hmm. but nobody wants to roll it back mm -hmm. either. If there's uh, already participatory budgeting <clears throat> or if there's an already ways to do uh, I voting petition and so on, uh, we see after the election, no matter what the party is, people are more interested in um, deepening the, the work in the name of so-called regional revitalization, uh, meaning that uh, <clears throat> places and townships with 50k or 100k people actually get to participate more in the local rulemaking as I shared about regional innovation. And again, that is embraced across the parties, right? And so uh, I don't think any of these are um, against any party ideology. That, that is why we always say, you know, we work when we work on open government, we're working actually on the 16th of the sustainable goals. And uh, piggybacking on the sustainable goals not only make it very clear that it is something that is cross-partisan, but it actually the entire humanity has agreed on, right? All the countries in the world uh, have uh, adopted the sustainable goals and say, you know, by 2030, we need to have a transparent um, institution. We need to protect fundamental platforms. We need to have effective accountability mm -hmm. uh, in shape and things like that. And so, that it, as part of the SDGs, I think really says that it's not only a uh, government's business, but really is a takes effective partnership across the board. So not only the government need to be more participatory, but as I said, the social enterprises, the co-ops, the, the, all the different organizations in the society are also learning from each other mm -hmm. in this kind of participatory um, decision making. And that really is what makes it impossible for any party to roll back. I've heard, I, I've heard when I was uh, researching you, sure. I heard that you were a very, you've said I'm, a, I'm an optimist. Like I'm yeah. And I wasn't sure if I believed you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I mean, you very clearly are. But how do you maintain optimism when uh, I feel I feel like now democracy as a concept is being challenged and pushed more than it has in not possibly about hundred years mm -hmm. maybe not quite that um, uh, but how do you maintain any kind of optimism please help me mm. well I mean Taiwan democracy is really new to this world. right yeah, really yeah, yeah, yeah. The first generation that can actually do democracy mm -hmm. <clears throat> right it's been around for only thirty years mm -hmm. so. Um, we're finding all this very curious and interesting and lots of experimentation mm -hmm. is taking place because there's no good old way, uh, good old way uh, to dictatorship, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, I think we're still in the early stages uh, when it comes to, to making democracy work, but actually the lack of legacy can actually enable more optimism because um, as you said, it's being challenged but actually so is lifting of the martial law, right? Mm -hmm. So is fighting for freedom of speech and assembly. Uh, so is uh, fighting during the martial law uh, for human rights, right? And these are actually much more violent and, and much more difficult mm -hmm. than the structure, struggles that we're facing now. Uh, we're actually sitting in a pretty beautiful place uh, to do this kind of work while our uh, parents' generation, our grandparents' generation really paid the early for, mm -hmm. for freedom. Uh, and so because of this, I think we're still in the kind of the first generation phase where we think everything is possible. And I think that's the root of optimism, it's not my personal um, history, it's everybody in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how can we transfer that optimism to places that do have longer histories of mm -hmm. democracy and are kind of seeing mm -hmm. their envelopes there push? Yeah, I'm not definitely not suggesting that you occupy your parliament. I'm not suggesting that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not suggesting that. Uh, 
actually, <laughs> but when I shared my thoughts um, in, in France, in Etalab, and, and they mm. had a uh, conversation with the local uh, civil society and so on, and right after I fly back to Taiwan, the new people who happens, I am not taking any credit. <laughs> <laughs> There's uh, constant references. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, um, but actually, um, a, a, a local level, I think it's easier. Uh, mm. The UK, for example, when I visited Edinburgh, uh, they have a long tradition of the social enterprises taking mm -hmm. care of pretty much everything, uh, right? And, and actually the Highland and Highland uh, Development Agency is a very good example of collaborative governance mm -hmm. uh, by the people and owned by the people uh, in a co-op-ish way, right? And, and so all these are very good local examples. You don't have to look uh, far away. There are pockets uh, that's uh, in the UK that are kind of self-running with the CICs or whatever mm -hmm. other structures you have. I think what is needed is to make it a new paradigm, a, a new imagination of uh, people seeing these and not just working with vulnerable people or working with um, you know, rough sleepers. Or, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's not just about particular sustainable goals, but these kind of uh, open innovation taken together is actually a, a valuable and viable uh, governance model. I think that is the, the key issue that uh, people need to just change their imagination around. I think all the raw materials are already there in the UK. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you what where your anarchism is. Hmm. Do you used to be an e, I don't know. Do you still like that? So what, conservative. Oh, okay. <laughs> what what does your anarchism look like? How does it um, uh, pertain to what you do day to day? Well, like like any anarchist or Taoist, um, it, it's all about not taking and giving orders, right? And the reason why uh, this radical horizontalism is needed is because really um, people who have different positions. They all have a lot to contribute, as the sustainable goals obviously say. But as soon as I give orders, people will start thinking that I have a preference between the economic, the social, the environmental, the, the whatever values. But because I'm a minister uh, that's entirely horizontal, my office is composed literally of different ministries, people who all have different values. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, channeling work that I do is just to make sure that people uh, can sh agree on common values despite their um, surface differences. And if I start giving orders, this kind of facilitated power uh, just dissipates. And so that is why I insist on being a purely facilitative minister while conserving the various traditions, uh, including the indigenous traditions, the uh, Hakka and Holo and um, you know the new migrant um, traditions, including of course our new uh, um, people from the uh, so-called uh, Greater East Asia and also other people with ARCs and without and so on. And so all, all these are important projects that Taiwan is a kind of stage of. Mm -hmm. And the more that we can include different uh, voices in the plurality, the less we need to give orders in the first place, because then people can start thinking that, okay, maybe they're not here to take away jobs or things like that, but actually can co-create something that is impossible when you're just starting from your own uh, population. Mm -hmm. um, this is probably not the most efficient way of me getting this answer, um, mm -hmm. uh, but foreign coverage of you is immensely positive. I mean, we love you. Mm. Like you, everybody. Oh, yeah, um, uh, fantastic, best mm. friends. Um, uh, but uh, foreign media coverage of you is intensely positive. Mm. Um, what am I missing by not reading Taiwanese accounts of you? Mm. Um, uh, like, are there are there any domestic critiques? Well, I think number one domestic critique at the moment when you Google for my uh, Mandarin uh, Chinese name mm. is that sometimes my name is used as a verb. Uh, <laughs> right. And what does that mean? Uh, so to confirm something uh, is to <laughs> right is to to lower its virality in dissemination. Uh -huh. and, and that that's because I talk very frankly yeah, about yeah, yeah. Uh, fact checking uh -huh. about how fact checking the Taiwan Fact Checking Center very soon will plug into the algorithm of Facebook and other large platforms, and so that the virality will actually dwindle uh, when something is fact checked as false and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so people have because I have a uh, um, uncanny uh, grasp of the algorithm, they somehow uh, mistake this understanding with control, uh, as if I can actually, you know, hack into the Facebook systems uh, and, and, and change their hyperparameters. We can neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can deny uh, very, very um, quickly and easily because really uh, I, I don't have any access. Uh, to, to Facebook or Google Plus um, mm -hmm. or whatever. Just to make it very clear. Just to make it abundantly clear. 
I so love that you mentioned yeah. Google Plus as well. That's oh, a yeah. But you, they're closing it now. I know, you know I know. That's uh, always sad. Yeah, we, we fought the great name wars. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Google Plus, and I will miss the name wars. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but, but what I mean basically is that uh, the fact that I uh, know about algorithmic uh, governance mm -hmm. or code based normativity sometimes um, lets people mistake that I can control it. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's not actually true. But on the other hand, I'm happy that people are using my name as a you know, giving me a Google-like status um, <laughs> and, and as a verb to remind each other the importance of the speech, uh, the freedom of speech and the freedom of assembly and freedom of expression. Because really, if you look around the world, um, Taiwan, in our region at least, is the only fully free uh, place. Mm -hmm. um, and there uh, is no other place, uh, that, at least in this region, um, that is have age expanding. Uh, civil society space in terms of uh, speech and assembly and so on. And so I, I think we, we need to serve as an example to the region that uh, having absolute uh, speech freedom plus a good social innovation system is actually... That dot of green, right? Yeah, it is yeah. actually good for democracy. It's not actually detrimental to democracy. And if we're and not... also looking, you score better than the UK and France and Spain. Well, thanks, for, thanks for making this look bad. Uh, <laughs> we're on par with, with Ireland. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, and, 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 and Canada. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> and then New Zealand. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I, I'm not saying that we're actually doing better than everybody in the world, but mm -hmm. in this region, really, Oh, but you are. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. So, so I think we need to keep this as a core value rather than an instrumental value. And I'm happy for my name to be used in this way to keep reminding people. Mm -hmm. That even with all these algorithmic um, ideas of virality, fact checking, and so on, still we're not taking away people's speech freedom. You know, we're not censoring people. Yeah. You have to go. Thank you so much for yeah. talking to me. Cool. Oh, you're such a